arts and culture really enrich and enliven the the lives of residents in our community. Where we don't have arts and culture opportunity, people don't have a, an outlet to express their creativity and they can lead to, you know, increased stress, health issues and things like that. Uh, mental health is obviously something that's at the forefront within our community and everything that we do within uh, within recreation and culture. Welcome to TOA Talks, the podcast from the town of Ajax. I'm your host, Devin Jarvis, the Supervisor of Communications and Engagement. And on today's episode, we're talking with Ajax's Director of Recreation and Culture, Chris Vita. Highlights from today's episode includes Chris talking about his work with the town for over 20 years and how he continues to be active within the community. The importance of targeted programming, such as the newly introduced Elevate Girls sport programming. Chris's passion for the arts and how that plays into his work with the town. T-O-A Talks. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Devin. Happy to be here. Thank you. So to start things off, we actually have a little bit of a quick icebreaker. So the bowl in front of you has a couple of fun questions in it. If you want to choose one and pass it to me to read off, we can get started. All right. Blindly looking away at this one <laughs> to make sure I'm not cheating. Oh, this is a good one. Would you rather go to a dance class or karaoke night? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of dance? Um, Any kind. <laughs> I think I would probably choose the karaoke night for myself. I'm a, I'm a bit of a singer. I love music. So I think that would be my, my choice there. Do you have a karaoke song of choice already in your mind that you would sing or Ooh. a genre? Hmm. I'm a sucker for 90s love ballads, I would say. <laughs> and after maybe a, a few drinks at a karaoke night might be one of the go-tos, I would say. Oh, absolutely amazing. So we'll have to set one of those up then in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> All right. So to get a little bit more into, I guess, the seriousness here, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, a little bit about myself, just a brief history, Town of Ajax, the Director of Recreation Culture for the last three and a half years now, and I've worked with Ajax for a little over 26 years now. I'm a longtime Ajax Durham resident, however, do reside in Whitby currently. I've been in the community since I was uh, approximately eight years old. We wow. moved here from the Scarborough area, so I've seen Durham region and Ajax specifically really grow and expand uh, over the uh, past couple decades since I've been here myself. And as I said, I live in the community community, recreate in the community and socialize within the community, active uh, playing volleyball within the area. I also have two children and pretty active and involved in their activities as well. Recreate. I've never heard that word before, but I actually really like that. I might steal it from you. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one to write down because your computer always wants to turn it into recreate. Right. Re they're separate words, but <laughs> identical. So that's a tricky one. Yeah, no, I definitely like that. And you mentioned um, that you've been with the town of Ajax for 26 years. That's a very significant time. Can you maybe walk us through how you got to your current role and where you started? Sure. Yeah. I'll go, go back a few years. So I started with the town of Ajax uh, when I was a high school student. Oh, wow. I was looking for part-time work in high school. And like many that age, I was expecting I would get a job at a fast food restaurant. Right. At the time, my, my mother worked part-time at the community center, the Ajax community center. And she was encouraging me to apply as a rink attendant. Mm -hmm. uh, I really wasn't interested in the position. I wasn't a hockey guy. I watched the sport casually, but really wasn't into it. But she encouraged me to apply and I ended up uh, getting the job and tried to keep an open mind. So I came in every day and worked my worked my tail off as a, as a part-time <laughs> kid pushing nets and sweeping change rooms at the Ajax Community Centre. I remember near the end of that uh, first season, we only had two arenas, pads one and two at the time. We hadn't fully expanded ACC with uh, pads three and four. And what I was hearing from a lot of the other staff was most of the staff got let go for the summer. They got laid off because there wasn't any work when the ice came out. So right. I was really being encouraged to look for work elsewhere, which I started doing and started looking around. I had my exit interview at the, uh, the end of that season and was fully expecting to be laid off and coming back in September. And the managers at the time said, we're going to keep you on for the summer. Uh, I was really pleased. I told them I was surprised. And they said, well, if we don't keep you, we're going to have our full-time marine operators quitting because they said you're the hardest worker <laughs> here. So it was very flattering and uh, really inspiring. And that sort of inspired me to continue to, to work hard my part-time years as a uh, for the town. 
Uh, from there, I, I advanced through a number of part-time roles, part-time arena operator driving the Zamboni and part-time pool operator. During the uh, university summers, I worked in the operations department as a summer student for a few years as a temp worker as well. Yeah. Ultimately, I needed to find full-time work. I wasn't able to continue my, my university education at that time. Uh, and the arenas was an area that I knew really well. So it was a logical place for me to, to look for full-time work. I completed some qualifications to work with our refrigeration plants and became a full-time arena operator uh, here in Ajax. I was in that role for a couple years, taking some brief stints to work actually within our finance department and in taxation. Okay. So you've been in operations, recreation, and finance. That's right. I, yeah. Any others? Because that's amazing. I, did, I didn't even know that about you. No, I think... The, yeah, just those three. Yeah. The, the, actually, the time in great. finance yeah. was was brief. <laughs> and I'll be honest, at, at the time I took that position, I wasn't really sure of, of my career path. As I said, I sort of gained full-time work as an arena operator because that came naturally. It was something that I knew, but I wouldn't say it was necessarily my passion. I was really into finance at the time, so I started taking some, some additional mm-hmm. courses, started working towards a business degree in commerce, which I eventually completed, as well as taking a look at some other finance-related courses, Canadian securities courses and things like that, and completed those things. And then uh, an opportunity came up for a temporary facility manager position. And I wasn't fully sure of where I wanted my career path to go at that point. But again, I tried to keep an open mind for the temporary role. I was successful in taking that role. At the time, I was the facility manager for what we call our satellite facilities portfolio. Uh, That was a time when our satellite facilities were really seeing a lot of growth. And I had the fortunate opportunity to be the facility manager for a number of our new buildings we were opening at the time. That included the Greenwood Discovery Pavilion, the Carruthers Marsh Pavilion, our St. Francis Center, uh, along with the rebuild of the Ajax Outdoor Pool. So really fortunate to land in that role at that time and have the experience of opening all those buildings and establishing the processes and all the things that come to do with uh, managing and and, uh, ensuring the facilities are clean and ready for our customers. A very interesting and inspiring career path. The reason why I kind of see it as inspiring is you started here as a high school student part-time and now you're in charge of the entire department. That's pretty incredible. So congratulations. That's absolutely amazing story. To kind of move on from there, Your department provides so many amazing programs, services, festivals, and events to the community. What is your favorite part about working in recreation and culture? So yeah, the the breadth of variety in the programming what we provide is really something that appeals to me. As I talked about, I came up in my career path within facilities and, you know, making sure our buildings were clean and maintained and safe and fixed and all that fun stuff. Um, And while I've always had a reputation as a bit of a facilities guy, that's not really necessarily where my passion or strengths lay. Um, I'm actually a bit more of an arts uh, arts guy. I'm a real strong supporter of the music industry. I'm a bit of a musician myself, a bit of a closet musician. I play keyboard. I sing a little bit. I've produced a few songs that I've actually released in the last couple of years. And I find that the being in this role as director, I now have the opportunity to oversee all of the operations of our department, including our culture and events section. So that's the area that oversees our special events, uh, things like St. Francis Center and performing arts and the other things that we do to support arts music within Ajax. So it's been a real benefit and positive for me to finally be able to have some impact on those artistic components and things that we deliver for, for Ajax residents. And we're in the process of, or I believe we've completed our 10-year arts and culture plan. And so with that being said, speaking about your passion for the arts, why is it important to have that for the community? Arts and culture are are very important to the health and well-being of a community. And it's something that I think we saw really strikingly and firsthand during COVID. Things like arts and culture, recreation programs, as most know, were some of the first things to shut down and remain shut down uh, for the periods of the pandemic that we were dealing with those things. Arts and culture really enrich and enliven the the lives of residents in our community. Where we don't have arts and culture opportunity, people don't have an outlet to express their creativity and they can lead to, you know, increased stress, health issues and things like that. Uh, mental health is obviously something that's at the forefront within our community and everything that we do within, within recreation and culture. And people just generally feel be- better about themselves when they're able to participate in arts and culture, when they're able to listen to music that they like 
hike or perform in shows or catch shows. Uh, so it really enriches and enlivens people's lives. Yeah. I mean, like even just for me, um, I was a long-term resident of Ajax. I grew up in Ajax. I no longer live in Ajax, but I do still live in the region. It is nice being able to go to the St. Francis Center for a local show rather than having to head into downtown Toronto. There's something right here in our backyard, um, a great venue, um, or even seeing public art out. The Pickering Village mural, like I love driving past it. I think it looks fantastic. So there's even, you know, just those like very small things that I think we would miss if we didn't have them. So thank you for walking us through that. Um, I really think our listeners are would be very interested to see the arts and culture plan and what comes of that over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. The arts and culture plan is a really, really exciting initiative for us. Uh, we've just had that plan finalized this past September for through council, and we're really excited for all the initiatives and projects that are going to come from that from that project. Our poet laureate is one of the projects that we're going to be moving forward with, hopefully next year, which will provide all kinds of opportunities for us as a town, as well as residents who who might be poets themselves and maybe not necessarily have the opportunity to to get their work out and uh, be seen and experienced by others. So I, we're really looking forward to, to getting a head start on all the initiatives within our arts and culture plan. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I'll be looking forward to that as well. And kind of on the same wavelength there, what is your favorite signature Ajax event? Oh, good question. Okay. I, this is going to be a two-part answer if that's okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, my favorite event to attend is Pumpkinville. Uh, I find Pumpkinville uh, is really sort of that end of end of fall event that we hold that it really brings a huge number of people within our community together at the Greenwood conservation area. Uh, we've got live music there. We've got face painting. There's food. There's all kinds of activities. We had a dinosaur oh, cool. exhibit for the kids this past year, which was really, really exciting. And the community comes out in droves for that event. It's one I try to attend with my family, myself every year. My kids really enjoy it. I took my father out uh, this past year. He really enjoyed it. So that's got to be my favorite event to experience as a customer. My favorite event to work with, I will say, is our Santa Claus parade. And the reason that's my favorite event is for the last uh, 12 to 15 years or so, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to drive our Zamboni as a float (laughs) during the Santa Claus parade. And our staff do a great job in decorating the machine with Christmas lights and music and all that fun stuff. The kids' faces just light up when they see the Zamboni driving by, even more so when it's got Christmas lights and rocking some Christmas tunes. And really just to see the the joy on their face and the smiles as they're waving and, and wishing you Merry Christmas and all that fun stuff during the Santa Claus parade is just, for me, it's almost the the kickoff event for me personally for the Christmas season and really, really helps get me into the holiday spirit and the holiday mood. So that's probably my favorite event to experience and work. Uh, those Both of those are great events. I've also been to Pumpkinville as a customer with my niece and nephew, and they love the haunted house in particular, uh, which was actually a lot spookier than I expected it to be for a family one. I was scared myself. So good job to your staff for that. You may or may not have the answer to this, but I'm just curious uh, myself playing hockey growing up. The Zamboni was always so slow and nice, but people loved it. What is the top speed? Do you know? Oh, the top, sp- you know, the, the, uh, the speedometer on the Zamboni is not in uh, miles per hour. No. It's, it's more of a, more of an RPM measurement. I think we max out at around between 15 and 20 kilometers. Okay, it yeah. might even be a little bit slower, but don't, but don't quote me on that one. Yeah, they definitely have safety in mind for that then. Yeah. I can, I can certainly tell you the, the drive back from town hall to the Ajax community center after the parade as a, maybe about a 40 minute drive. So wow. that might give us okay. an idea yeah. of how fast the vehicle goes. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's already at home, you know, got their PJs on. You're still trying to make it back to the ACC. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great experience. I, I love it. I will say. <laughs> well, with that being said, is there anything you can share with listeners that your department is looking forward to bringing to the community in the next year? Yeah. One of the things I wanted to really talk about that that we're really excited about is some of the girls in sport initiatives Mm. that our department has uh, begun this year that will continue to spill into 2024 and beyond. Girls in sport is an initiative that we've we've started over the last year, really trying to uh, focus on providing opportunities specifically for girls only sports. We've done a lot of research on this topic over the, the last number of years. And what the data really shows is youth girls, and particularly in that age 9 to 14 age range, are typically seeing participation drop-offs in their Mm -hmm. sport programs. Some of the reasons why we're seeing that participation rate drop is that 
uh, girls are feeling different differently about their bodies changing and different things that they're going through in life. And they often feel more hesitation to participate in sports when there's a presence of boys around. But the research also suggests that we're, you're able to eliminate those barriers, such as having the girls in their own gym, you know, without spectators walking by. So the boys team isn't, isn't, you know, talking to them and watching. <laughs> yep. It really creates a difference. And we found great increases in participation rates when we've been able to provide those girls only opportunities. Uh, an example that I can provide for you is our drop-in basketball. Mm -hmm. um, we have for years and decades provided drop-in basketball regularly at our community centers. It's a very well-intended attended program, but it's been predominantly male attended, even though it's a program that's been co-ed. In fact, our numbers suggest it's 95 plus male as a co-ed program. This past year, we introduced a girls only version of drop-in basketball and we sell out every session. The girls come out in droves. And these are participants that even when we had the co the co-ed opportunity, were not coming out to right. the uh, to the sport. So it's great to see the increase in girl participation in our in our sports. And we're really excited to continue that into 2024. One initiative specifically I'd like to touch on is a, is a recent partnership that we've started with the Jay's Care Foundation. Okay. Jay's Care Foundation is going to be sponsoring some of our camps next year, including our March nice. Break Elevate Girls Sports Camp. So that will provide uh, unique opportunities for a number of girls to participate and try a variety of different sports throughout the week, baseball as well, with equipment and supplies being supported, being provided by the Jay's Care Foundation. So we're really excited for that initiative next year and really excited to continue to grow our girls' sport only initiatives. Okay, so the past few years have been a little bit interesting and challenging um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. The word unprecedented has been used, of course, as a buzzword throughout this time. The town had to pivot and make changes to our programming during the pandemic. How did your department come together and work around these changes? That's a that's a great question. The uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic was probably one of the more difficult difficult things our department has had to endure due to the closures that resulted. So I I actually came into the role as director of recreation and culture on an interim basis near the beginning of the pandemic. I think it was around the August September time frame. Uh, we had closed a number of our facilities over the course of the summer due to government mandates and restrictions and that sort of thing. And recreation as a department, quite honestly, was beaten down. Our services were closed. Many of our buildings were closed. Staff weren't able to come in to work their jobs. So it was severely impactful to our staff. I remember even at the beginning of the of the pandemic as a facility manager at the time, working the McLean Community Center where we're, where we're recording out of now with no other staff in the building wow. at all, just myself doing some cleaning, maintenance, making sure in the building was running and not falling apart. It was a it was a totally unique experience. And it was it's an interesting thing. For years before that, I would always I'd always comment to staff, imagine how much work we could get done if if customers just weren't in the building. <laughs> and it was uh, it was always surprising to me how much work was in fact available for us to do even though the doors were shut. But the as I said, the pandemic was was severely impactful to our department, and it forced us to make a number of changes in all kinds of different business areas to ensure and to ensure our operations could continue in some fashion when we were mandated to do so. That included different things like restrictions on number of people and programs, right. restrictions to the number of people could be in our pools and on our arenas at the time. This was a really, really challenging thing for staff to manage. So some of the things we had to implement were sign-up systems for public swim. In normal times, you would show up to a public swim or public skate time and go on right. the ice or in the pool. And during the pandemic, our residents had to pre-register online to a maximum of 25, depending on, on, on the particular time of the pandemic. So that was super hard. It led to a lot of people being unable to participate just because we were, we were maxed out quite frequently right. for a number of our programs. Customers, as you can imagine, were upset with that. I think there was a lot of frustration in general with the pandemic going on and then to sometimes get a red flag from your recreation department when you're just trying yes. to take your kids swimming or skating was certainly challenging for our customers to, to deal with and consequently difficult for our staff to manage as well. Uh, so those were some of the some of the changes. We went through a period where we needed vaccination 
proof at our entrances to the community centers. Uh, so our staff and security were were mandated to to work our front, work our doors, and screen everybody coming into the building. As I think we're all aware, there are a number of people who felt strongly about vaccination mandates, and certainly that was a level of frustration that our staff and security were met with at the uh, entrances to our community centers and programs. So that was very, very difficult for our staff to deal with at the time. But I will say that coming out of the pandemic, recreation is back and probably stronger than it's ever been. We've seen participation rates in most of our programs jump back up to pre-pandemic levels. Everybody wants to come out and uh, swim, skate, attend aquatic lessons, play sports and programs, and come out to our special events, which are seeing record numbers of participation uh, than we've ever seen. So we've really seen uh, strong interest and drive to return to recreation coming out of the pandemic. And that's something we expect to continue. I do have to say it's been pretty amazing after so many years there of seeing our facilities a little bit emptier, just how full of life they are right now. It's um, a Thursday during the day and our recreation facilities filled. And on that same line of thought, have you continued to implement some of these changes post pandemic? Is there anything that worked really well and that people really liked and we're continuing? I think one of the one of the big pieces for us that came out of the pandemic was how do we communicate to our customers and to our residents when they're not coming into our building right. and they're not seeing the signs we have posted on our walls and and being able to talk with staff. So how how we reached our customers is really something that became challenging for us. We had to find electronic means to communicate as well as provide opportunities for customers to sign up for programs and things like that that they normally or previously would not have had to do so. So a number of things came out of that, including a push to be more digitized as a whole yes. for our department. Uh, one of the projects we're looking to work on right now is a digital version of our recreation program guide. This is a guide that we produce three times a year that lists the different aquatics programs, summer camps, and all the other interest programs that we have. We ceased production of this during the pandemic because we didn't have any programs to right. promote. And coming out of the pandemic, we've recognized that the paper version of that version of that document is, won't be the way we move forward. So right now we're working on creating an electronic version that you could access from your phone or from your computer and punch in the specifics for you and your family, and then create almost a personalized recreation guide for you that fits your interest, age demographics, oh, and yeah. all that other different things. So we're a little bit ways away from that, but we're busy behind the scenes working towards uh, getting that out. And we hope within the next year or so to have that as a so. working project for us. And I understand that there is a 55 plus guide though as well. That one's going to continue to be printed, right? The 55 plus guide uh, continues to be uh, printed currently. As we talk about the different ways in which our customers choose to want to hear from us and want to communicate with us, one of the one of the loudest things we heard coming out of the pandemic from our 55 plus and older age groups were that they wanted physical paper. They right. want to be able to visit a community center and walk out with a paper guide that says what uh, what programs we have, when they are and where they are. We do find our older adults are a little bit more traditional in the way they choose to receive uh, information. So uh, currently we still produce a 55 plus older adult guide specifically for them. And if somebody wanted that guide, they could just walk into any of our community centers and either just pick it up from the counter or ask a staff member. They can walk into any of our community centers. Uh, they can take a look online at ajax.ca for the digital copy. They could also visit our St. Andrews uh, Friendship Club, as well as our Pickering Village Seniors Club to get a paper copy as well. Huh, amazing. And Chris, I mean, this has been a really interesting conversation. Is there anything that you wish the community knew about your department or any misconceptions that anybody might have for our last question here today? I think if I could if I could leave our listeners with any message, it would be, and this is a, a message I shared with my staff recently at a, at a planning day event we uh, we held, is is just to be kind to each other. One of the things we we hear from our staff coming out of the pandemic is that there's a, a shorter level of patience right. with some of our customers. Um, and I just want to let uh, residents know that our recreation staff are working hard uh, day in, day out to provide the services and the programs that, that our residents want to see. Sometimes, sometimes they get full. Sometimes there may not be capacity in a program. We ask that everybody be patient and be a little bit kinder to us. One of the things I tell my staff is that I think we could, uh, there's all kinds, 
we could avoid so many of the problems that we see day to day by just being a little bit kinder and empathetic to to one another. So I think that's a message I would share with our customers as well. Yeah, and no, that's um, a fantastic message for everyone, Chris. So thank you for sharing that as well. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you today. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and letting um, our listeners know a little bit more about the inside of recreation and culture and what your role is like as a director here. Great. Thank you for having me, Devin. I'm Devin Jarvis with the Town of Ajax TOA Talks podcast. Episodes can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and on our webpage at ajax.ca slash TOA Talks. Listeners can download and listen to each episode offline or online from their personal device. If you have comments or feedback about our show, you can email corporate at ajax.ca. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk later, Ajax.